Hi, I'm Joan Bogdan for the Real Time Casting Training Channel. When you're recording auditions from home, you play the part of an audio engineer as well as voiceover talent. Whether you're choosing a mic or setting up recording software on a computer or a mobile device, it's important to understand the fundamentals of how digital audio works. In this episode, we'll go over some of the basic principles of digital sound, including how a microphone hears your voice and how recording software captures sound. One of the key components of working with digital audio is the waveform, which is the visual representation of sound waves. The horizontal axis measures time, while the vertical axis measures amplitude, or the loudness of the audio signal, such as your recorded voice. The more quiet the audio signal, the closer the peaks and valleys are to the center line. When the audio signal is too high, the recording will be loud and the peaks will be cut off or clipped, which will result in a distorted sound. You can always boost or grow the audio after the recording, but you can't correct it if it's clipped or distorted. The peaks and valleys of a waveform can be used to identify separate words, syllables, or even breaths. For example, here's the waveform for a short voiceover recording. We'll zoom in and overlay the text of the script. Notice that the amplitude decreases at the end of each word. This small section is not a word, it's actually a breath. When I play the recording, you can see how each word corresponds to the waveform. Whatever your income, it's important to know about finance. If you know how to use a word processor, you already know something about working with digital audio. However, instead of individual words, you work with sections of the waveform. For example, to move this portion of the text, I can just cut and paste. And I can do the same thing in the waveform, as well as select and delete the breath. It's important to know about finance, whatever your income. There are several terms that you will come across when working with digital audio, such as sample rate, bit depth, and audio format. Now it's important to understand these terms as their settings are a part of any recording software or recording app. A digital photograph's resolution or amount of pixels can affect the quality of the picture. The quality of digital video can also be affected by the resolution, as well as the number of frames per second. Similarly, the quality of a digital recording depends on several factors. The first is the sample rate, which is the number of samples captured per second in order to represent the sound. The more samples per second, the more accurate the recording. For example, the sample rate for CD quality audio, considered the standard for audio auditions, is 44,100 samples per second, or 44.1 kilohertz. The other measure of audio quality is the bit depth, which is usually measured by the number of computer bits used to represent each sample. The more bits that are used, the more precise the representation of each sample. 16-bit is a common sample format for audio interfaces, USB microphones, and audio audition files, although higher quality digital equipment is usually 24-bit. Increasing the sample rate or the number of bits in each sample increases the quality of the recording, but also increases the amount of space used by audio files. Audio files can be saved in different formats. The formats with the most audio information and which take up the most space are uncompressed, such as a WAV file or the AIF file format commonly seen on the Mac. The MP3 format is actually a compressed format that takes up far less space without a significant loss of quality, making them ideal for sending auditions via email. When you save a recording as an MP3 file, you specify the level of compression you want. 128 kilobits per second is the most common bit rate for audio audition files. And it's equally important to understand how a microphone hears your voice. So let's take a look at that. The term frequency response refers to the lows and highs in the tone of your voice. The frequency of human hearing is in the range of about 20 hertz to 20 kilohertz, or 20K. To record voice most accurately, uh, you'll want a microphone that can capture that range. 
Some microphones are tweaked to have bumps and dips at certain frequencies, and some mics have a flat response, meaning uh, no, no frequencies are accentuated. This makes some mics better suited for different situations, such as a mic that is used for a promo read. Condenser mics are used for most voiceover recording because they have a wider frequency response which helps capture the subtleties in the voice. There are basic terms audio professionals use to describe a sound. There's the low end, the mid-range, and the high end. Every microphone has a frequency response chart. The frequency response chart will show you the area where it's relatively flat and where certain frequencies are enhanced, um, such as the low end or the high end. The human voice is mostly located in the mid-range. So here are a couple of recordings that demonstrate each frequency band. So here's an example of just the low range. Our Alliance continually anticipates and reveals opportunities. Now here's an example of the high end. Our Alliance continually anticipates and reveals opportunities. Here is an example of the mid-range. Kind of sounds like a telephone voice. Our Alliance continually anticipates and reveals opportunities. All of those elements together make up the full human voice. Our Alliance continually anticipates and reveals opportunities. As a voice artist, you probably want to focus on the low and high bands. Uh, most people are told they're either very bright or sibilant, which would represent the high end, or you're very deep or bassy, representing the low end. The ideal, if you want to capture a voice exactly as it is, is to have a flat frequency response chart. You've probably recorded on the Neumann U87, uh, as it's the standard in many recording studios. It has a great mid-range presence with a frequency response that is close to flat, which means it captures everything but it doesn't enhance too much, uh, and it's not artificial. The Rode NTK2 microphone is very smooth, and its range is relatively flat as well. Speakers and headphones have a frequency response as well which indicates how accurately they are playing back the recording. Again, a flat response will be more accurate. Voiceover veteran Harlan Hogan designed a pair of headphones that are ideal for listening to auditions and your voiceover recordings because they accurately represent the sound of the recording. Where you stand in relation to the microphone can also affect the captured sound. In an earlier episode, we discussed the various pickup patterns of microphones, with cardioid being the most common pickup pattern for voiceover microphones, because it captures what is directly in front of the mic and ignores the rest. If you position your mouth to the side of a cardioid microphone, the sound may not be as clear as if you stood directly in front of it. Similarly, how you address the mic will depend on the type of microphone. Dynamic mics have a front address, while condenser mics have a side address. Another term you might hear is the proximity effect. This is basically uh, when you get closer to a mic, the more you're going to hear the lower and, and bass frequencies. Uh, it can give you a more a warmer, more intimate sound, but if your voice is already deep, it can get a little muddy. Now, no doubt you've heard voiceovers that sound dark and ominous due to eating the mic. That's a proximity effect in action. The microphone hears not only your voice, but also the environment surrounding the mic. The typical professional recording studio is a custom-built, enclosed, acoustically treated space. Another option is a pre-built sound isolation booth, like the Whisper Room. Both of these rely on acoustic foam to absorb the sound of the room. When recording at home, there are some less expensive options for improving the recording environment. A walk-in closet, for example, provides a small space with lots of absorption from all the hanging clothes. Some people have found that isolating the mic in an acoustic box or using a three-panel screen with acoustic foam on it works well. Noises in the room have frequencies too. For example, the hum of your air conditioner is a low-end frequency. Typically, a dynamic mic will pick up less background noise because they're less sensitive. For example, when you look at the frequency response chart of the Rode Podcaster, you can see how it rolls off at the high end. Now, why can't you just remove the background noise from the audio? Well, some of those frequencies may also be a part of the voice. So when you remove them, the voice can sound hollow or metallic. 
just as removing a certain shade of yellow from this photo alters it. There are, however, several ways to reduce the sound you don't want, such as turning off the air conditioner, moving the microphone away from computer fans, and closing extraneous programs such as web browsers, because the more the computer has to do, the more likely it is that the fan will rev up. If you tend to keep your computer on nonstop, sometimes rebooting it quiets the fan down. I hope this episode has demystified some of the hows and whys of digital audio. In the next episode, we'll discuss some of the ideas behind buying a mic and discuss the proper way to set up a microphone. So I'll see you then.